Good morning, and welcome to day two of our conference, Federalism on Trial, Lessons from COVID-19. I'm Scott Paul. I serve as Interim Director and Executive Director here at the Center for Constitutional Studies at Utah Valley University in Orem, Utah. Speaking on behalf of my colleagues here, we are thrilled to have you join us as we consider successes and potential shortcomings of American federalism during the COVID-19 pandemic. Throughout the day today, we invite you to submit questions for our speakers in the comments section of this YouTube feed. You may also email questions to constitution at uvu.edu. Before our first panel of the day begins, please allow me a few words of introduction and acknowledgement. Organized in 2011, the Center for Constitutional Studies is a nonpartisan academic institute that promotes the instruction, study, and research of constitutionalism. Our mission is to increase constitutional literacy in our local, state, and national communities. We at the center express deep gratitude to the Utah State Legislature and especially to the legislature's Utah Federalism Commission for their enduring commitment to functional federalism and for their support of our Federalism Index Project. We also thank UVU Provost Dr. Wayne Vaught and UVU President Dr. Astrid Tuminez for their support of our center. I also offer sincere appreciation to the, member, to the members of our center's advisory board for their invaluable guidance. Last but definitely not least, I must acknowledge Dr. Andy Bibby, who serves as associate director here in the center. Dr. Bibby leads the Federalism Index Project, which I'm sure he'll describe uh, during this conference. He, along with his outstanding team, have organized this conference. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce you to the moderator of this session, Dr. Andy Bibby. In addition to serving as Associate Director here at the Center for Constitutional Studies, Dr. Bibby is an Assistant Professor of Political Science. He teaches classes in political science, political theory, and American heritage. His latest book, which examines Thomas Jefferson and his political rivals will be published by the University of Virginia Press this December. Professor Bibby, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Scott. Um, welcome and uh, thank you everyone. Thank you everyone for joining us for the second day of this Federalism Project virtual event. I'll be helping to moderate today's first session. So this is the second day of our conference, but I expect we will have some new viewers. If you missed yesterday's session, we do hope to be able to post the sessions online at www.uvu.edu slash ccs. Uh, please also feel free to email us if you're looking for a specific panel. Uh, next, I thought I could start with just a brief background for those of us joining for the first time. This conference is one of three major public events on the topic of American federalism. We will also be hosting a three-day academy on federalism in April, as well as a summer workshop for teachers in 2021. If you're a high school teacher or a legislator looking for CLE credit, do feel free to contact us for opportunities and to get involved. So the Federalism Index Project is a data visualization project. It was launched in uh, 2016, and its focus is on the study and understanding of American federalism. The CCS Federalism Initiative is now in its third year of development, and its aim in a sentence is to provide usable data for researchers, educators, and state leaders. In essence, it's an empirical project but as you will see today, numbers just can't tell the whole story. We think we learn best through dialogue, rational debate, civil discussion, and uh, conferences and panels like, like this. So part of what we're doing today is to encourage people to get interested in the drama of American federalism. Justice Kennedy in a famous case, NFIB v. Sebelius, uh, noted that the structural protections in the US Constitution, so these are namely separation of powers and federalism, have less obvious a connection to individual rights. 
quote, and so have less obvious a connection to personal freedom than the provisions of the Bill of Rights or the Civil War Amendments. Hence, argued Kennedy, they tend to be undervalued or even forgotten by our citizens. Uh, in that same decision, Kennedy said that it was the court's job to remind people that the structural pr protections were, in his words, the most important protections in the US Constitution. And as evidence, he went on to note that these protections alone were not left to later amendment. Coming back to today's topic, it seems fair to suggest that many Americans are questioning even these structural protections. COVID-19 has forced us to ask, for example, whether our federal system is really up to the task of responding to the pandemic. So let's return to our question from yesterday. Is federalism working? And if you joined us yesterday, you saw that one of our panelists answered this by, by giving two cheers for federalism. I would say that many of our panelists also with, withheld their third cheer, but for different reasons and interesting reasons. Um, the second question I ask today's panelists to think about is this. What are our options to enhance interstate cooperation, interstate communication, and dialogue among and between the states as we think about uh, reopening specifically? Uh, with that, I'm genuinely thrilled to turn to our first panel for today, who will help us think about and, and better as, understand the challenges that different states face as they consider reopening. We have three outstanding scholars and renowned teachers with us, Walter Olson, Lauren Heller, and Daniel Mallinson. We will start with uh, Walter Olson. Walter Olson is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute's Robert A. Levy Center for Constitutional Studies and is known for his writing on the American legal system. He has published several books, his most recent being Schools for Misrule on the State of the Law Schools. His first book, The Litigation Explosion, was one of the most widely discussed general audience books on law of its time. It led the Washington Post to dub him, quote, intellectual guru of tort reform, end quote. Active on social media, he is known as the founder and principal writer of what is generally considered the oldest blog on law, as well as one of the most popular, overlawyered.com. I have to read you the subtitle of the blog, Chronicling the High Cost of Our Legal System. Please go have a look. Mr. Olson has advised many public officials from the White Council councils, and in 2015 was named by Governor Larry Hogan to be co-chair of the Maryland Redistricting Reform Commission, which issued its report recommendations later that year to acclaim across the state. Welcome, Mr. Olson, and I will turn the time over to you. Well, thank you so much, Professor Bibby. And <clears throat> I'm gonna jump in by talking about some of the successes and failures of regulation during the pandemic. Uh, it will eventually tie back in, I promise, to federalism, but it will take a while to get there. And one theme that has come up with a lot of uh, people who study regulation uh, in response to the pandemic is that there is a tension between regulation and resilience. Uh, systems of regulation or lawmaking for that matter, uh, have to make rules for private actors. They can never foresee all of the unlikely situations. Uh, they wind up with rules that perhaps don't cause any problem uh, or any discomfort for 30 or 40 years, and then the unexpected happens, and the rules don't fit. Now, how well does the system of regulation handle that? Uh, are there pr provisions for exception making and do they work well? Uh, and we've seen some of the success stories and some of the failures. The failures are very well known and widely commented on uh, in the policy community, particularly the Federal Food and Drug Administration uh, with its failure to approve COVID testing, with its uh, congressionally mandated manufacturing control of medical devices, which means that everything from N95 masks to 
pipettes and stoppers and tubes needed for testing uh, got bottlenecked uh, and often delayed by weeks or months because of the difficulty of getting FDA clearance for what the medical people knew needed to be done. So tremendous failures um, in uh, some of the most high profile federal regulatory agencies when it came to the resilience needed to respond to this emergency. At the same time, there are successes. And uh, let me tick off some areas where the system performed somewhat better, often quite a bit better uh, when the pandemic broke this spring. Uh, for example, uh, you may remember that supply lines were suddenly very challenged, both in supplying medical equipment and supplies and in supplying groceries uh, when uh, things began uh, locking down. And the uh, federal regulations of trucking, such as they are, the labor regulations in particular that provide for hours of service uh, maxima, which were something the trucking industry could live with during ordinary times. All of a sudden, when you had to do uh, 36 hour runs uh, in order to get something to a hospital, they stopped working. And sure enough, uh, there were a lot of quick waivers granted uh, in trucking and logistics. There were, uh, at the state level, uh, there were uh, rules against telemedicine, the provision of medicine over uh, phone lines. There were rules against uh, interstate practice by nurses or medical professionals licensed in only one state. Um, I'm not going to say that the states were perfect because they weren't. Uh, some of them preserved the protectionist rules, but there was a lot of quick adjustment uh, where there needed to be. And uh, some of those areas are uh, success stories too. And you can trace it down to lesser known areas. For example, some states had rules saying that insurance agents could only do their work from a brick and mortar office and not from their home. Well, generally, uh, state insurance regulation works well enough that that kind of thing was very quickly addressed because uh, the regulators are close enough to the regulated parties to listen. Now, in uh, as part of a Cato Institute project that is going to involve many papers by many authors about uh, uh, the response to the pandemic. The, uh, the title is Pandemics and Policy, and I encourage you all to go to the Cato site where you'll see the first dozen or so papers in that series. Uh, I'm working on a paper not yet finished. You all get to be the tryout audience for some of the ideas that I have not thoroughly thought out yet. So the question and answer might in fact help me finish the piece. But um, I'm looking at an area that has not gotten as much attention, uh, which is overwhelmingly federal in its impetus rather than state driven, and which I think has worked very poorly. And I think I've identified some of the reasons it's worked poorly, uh, which may get us back at some point to the federalism theme, as well as other themes about regulation. And it's one slice of the set of issues that uh, relate to reopening. Uh, when a business or an employer wants to reopen, uh, obviously it wants to do so as safely as possible. It wants to listen to good advice about uh, what is safe to do and what is, creates too much of a risk of contagion of the COVID-19 uh, um, uh, virus. And so around the country, thousands of employers were facing their own versions of, all right, uh, who should be the skeleton staff at the headquarters and who should work from home? And for many of them, uh, it was pretty easy to read the literature and see the checklist of who was at most risk of getting sick. Well, older people, older than 65 or older than 70. So keep them home. Uh, people with uh, health preconditions, diabetes, various uh, pulmonary lung conditions, uh, keep them home because there was a significantly higher chance that they would uh, have very serious cases should they contract it. Um, and a little bit more subtly, but still emerging quickly, uh, even members of your workforce who were uh, not vulnerable themselves might be part of a household that was vulnerable. For example, a 45 year old might be at low risk of serious COVID, but what if she lives with two elderly parents? And what if her husband is immunosuppressed? Then all of a sudden you've got an employee who is not herself a huge public health risk, but who is socially a public health risk. So you wanna keep her home too uh, and assign work so that the people at lowest social risk and lowest personal risk are the ones going in uh, meeting with the customers were needed, keeping the skeleton staff going. Well, 
There are problems here, but let me keep on a little bit with what a good reopening plan might look like before I turn to what the problems are. Uh, the uh, first you want to ask people when you're not sure whether they've got a pre-existing condition, ask them point blank, do you have it or do you not? Uh, you want to ask people about whether their families are as sick or vulnerable as you think they are. Uh, and there's another thing, which is it was soon discovered that people who had had the disease and gotten over it uh, tended to have antibodies almost never, there are rare exceptions, but almost never get sick again themselves. Uh, and those employees are potentially enormously valuable because they're not at risk for the most part with the tiny exceptions. And they're also much less likely than all of the other employees to pass it on to someone else. So you might want to recruit them by preference to the customer facing positions, to the positions which deal with a lot of coworkers. And if you can neutralize the risk of contagion from those key positions, you've really made progress. So get those uh, workers through an antibody test and uh, may, confirm that they uh, are have, have the antibodies and then uh, get them out there to do the most good. Well, readers who follow employment law uh, uh, are probably lifting right out of their chairs screaming at this point, because in describing a rational so, um, a set of criteria for reopening your business. Uh, I have just described about six different violations of federal law, uh, and who knows how many violations of state law. Um, you are apt to be sued uh, from a bunch of different directions, multiple protected groups, uh, multiple different legal theories, if you do what I just described was going through a lot of managers' minds as the safest way, uh, the most humanitarian way, the lowest risk way of reopening your workforce. And so let's start with the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, or ADEA. It makes it unlawful to take any adverse action, and keeping someone home even at full salary can be construed as an adverse action uh, because they are older. Uh, period. Uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act is a little bit more forgiving. It lets you uh, take into account people's membership in the um, high-risk groups medically, um, but only if it presents a, quote, direct threat to their health. And uh, as the EEOC, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, has pointed out, uh, it's been construed very, very tightly. Uh, elevated risk is not enough to make the distinction. Uh, near certain injury, yes, that probably would be. But don't assume that elevated risk is going to get you over that hurdle. Uh, forget about inquiring on their family members. Uh, as the EEOC says in its guidance, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, or GINA, many of you have never heard of that law, uh, prohibits employers from asking employees medical questions about their family members. And on down the line, the EEOC says you may not do antibody testing, although they concede that you can test people for current infection where they are uh, currently contagious. You can't test for antibodies, says the EEOC. And they cite the ADA on that. So, <laughs> Somehow you work through all of this and you manage to avoid getting sued and you get some of your people back to serve the customers who are beginning to, to come in. Now you're facing new questions. Um, some of the most obvious things you can do to keep your employees safe and keep the customers safe from each other is to require people to wear a mask when they enter your store uh, and perhaps to take their temperature with one of those little forehead temperature guns um, when they uh, knock on the door in the first place. Uh, that's done, as we know, at many businesses, uh, uh, the place where they cut my hair does it and uh, the dentist does it. Um, but it's surprisingly controversial legally uh, whether you can do uh, effectively either of those things. And on masks, for example, by the summer, uh, there were already, uh, how many is it? Uh, nine lawsuits in one week being filed against retailers' mask wearing policies by people saying, uh, by customers saying that they were hassled uh, uh, even though they had said that they were exempt under the Americans with Disabilities Act from having to wear masks. Uh, the uh, and the law of how ADA applies to masks is uh, seemingly helpful to the store in this case, but the trick is, the catch is, 
that you have no legal right to ask for documentation. You have no legal right to ask for a doctor's note or to inquire what the disability is. Uh, there's, the law differs, but uh, Pennsylvania, for example, um, said flatly that, uh, that customers may enter the premises and are not required to provide documentation of their medical condition. That's the view of a lot of disabled rights lawyers. So uh, technically you have the right to require masks of everyone except those with a genuine ADA e exemption, but you're not allowed to find out whose exemption is genuine. So uh, in in fact, your, your hands are tied. And um, likewise, you might get sued under some of the theories promulgated by the ACLU for doing the forehead temperature testing. So somehow or other, you um, uh, forage on, uh, and then there's an outbreak in your workplace. And uh, then you have to face some difficult questions about, all right, you know who's sick, but should you tell the other workers, uh, should you tell customers that that person is sick? They might have spent more time than you realize uh, in a long sales call or in uh, huddling in the cafeteria with that particular person. Well, the, <clears throat> now you find out about privacy law, all sorts of privacy laws passed uh, when no one was thinking of pandemics, make it legally extremely risky to reveal any health information about your workers, whether to coworkers or to customers. So the EEOC trying to be reasonable says, uh, maybe you can kind of disguise things as someone on the fourth floor got sick. <laughs> because the, the rumor mill is already working. And when you put in partial information of this sort, of course the rumor mill works even harder trying to figure out who on the fourth floor. And rumor mills always produce some false rumors. Uh, are you a allowed to reveal the truth in response to a false rumor? Well, no, you actually probably aren't because the law simply says you can't reveal the information in many instances. So um, this all gets especially exciting when you are in one of the kinds of workplaces where there are additional layers of privacy law. Universities, for example, are a good example of this because of FERPA, the federal law which uh, tightly controls release of information, including medical information about students. So you have complaints from faculty, and I think there are very plausible complaints around the country, that university administrations uh, are not giving them a fair heads up when there has been potential contagion and outbreak in their own classrooms, because they're afraid of stepping on FERPA, so they won't tell uh, which student it was, even if it turns out to have been the front row student, or even if it turns out to have been the student who clustered with some others against your good advice as a professor. So by this point, uh, the thought may be occurring to you, uh, suit if I do, suit if I don't, uh, certainly if you run one of these institutions. And that's exactly one of the right thoughts to have because um, these laws are in fact often contradictory. A story that I love to tell is when the state of Connecticut was reopening, it told businesses not to let older people and people with uh, immune deficiencies uh, come back to work. And then lawyers had to call up the state of Connecticut, which of course is a sophisticated party with lots of lawyers on its own payroll. And say, You're not aware of federal law. You just told Connecticut employers to break the law. Um, in fact, it's very, very hard to act while knowing that you're not um, going to get sued one way or the other. Because of course, if someone contracts the disease uh, with good reason to believe that it was at your workplace, they're going to have those legal theories to aim against you. Uh, I noticed a bunch of customers without masks. Well, you can say, we tried to argue with some of them and then we gave up. Uh, that's not necessarily an argument that a lawyer and a jury will accept. Likewise, um, uh, the lawyers already are talking about suits based on failure to do temperature checks. And the answer, uh, I read that if you did that, you could get sued, is not a good enough answer. So this leads us into a big critique of regulation in general, which is that it does not always give people clear rules as to how they are supposed to behave and how they're supposed to arrange their affairs. It ties directly into debates about the rule of law, which um, classically is supposed to uh, require law to be uh, uh, accessible, clear, and non-contradictory so that people can arrange their affairs and conduct their uh, uh, workplace in such a way as to be sure they're not going to uh, commit a, a legal offense. Well, we have taken that away in many different areas and it is illustrative that uh, COVID response is one of them. A couple more points before I wrap up. Uh, first, you notice that a lot of the laws that I've been citing, uh, whether it be discrimination or privacy, uh, are couched in terms of rights. 
They are presented as an extension in some cases of the civil rights revolution, even into areas like uh, the plight of older people on the job that are not all that much like the traditional uh, goals of civil rights. Um, and it's been observed that uh, in other countries, for example, the attempt to create accommodation and assistance for disabled people in the workforce sometimes goes on by frank regulation. There will be a government agency that puts out architectural plans saying, okay, now you have to have ramps by next year, you have to have assistive devices for blind and deaf employees. In the US, that's not by and large how we do it. Instead, we um, have a vague prescription enforced by one-on-one -on -one litigation, and we call it rights rather than calling it a regulatory process. Um, the effect, of course, is that of a regulatory process, but one with a great deal of uncertainty as to where the uh, legal challenge will come from. You can satisfy five of your disabled employees in a row and then find that someone was dissatisfied by those same accommodations and you're being sued. Uh, there is no safe harbor by and large. There is no green light. These are terms that lawyers use and which often signify that something has been brought into the tent of, of rule of law uh, planability. So you have um, often very narrow exceptions, exceptions that are hard to use. Uh, this is especially harmful for the pandemic in which you often want to be able to use some tests that have an error rate. You wanna be able to introduce some screens that don't screen out perfectly because it's the cumulative effect of tests and screens, none of which are perfect, but each of which adds somewhat to the probability that you are going to prevent the contagious connection um, that makes for good pandemic protection. You want a bunch of imperfect screens because together they get you to a high overall rate of prevention, and yet uh, imperfect screens are the ones that come under most suspicion from uh, both privacy law and, uh, and, and discrimination law. So that's where we wind up. Uh, it seems to me that uh, systems that uh, in fact are regulatory, but that couch themselves as rights oriented have responded less well um, to, to the pandemic, uh, in part because they are not really permission oriented. Uh, with a lot of ADA issues, there is no way to effectively get a green light. Uh, and so, uh, no one will take away the crown of the Food and Drug Administration as the worst behaving government actor. Um, but I would note that um, uh, these are, as I say, generally federal enactments. They have proved extraordinarily inflexible. Uh, they suggest, at least to me, uh, another of the costs of letting uh, difficult government policy move up to the federal level where there is one and often very inflexible uh, prescription. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Olson. Thank you for, for helping us to think more about the, the connection and I guess some of the, the less well understood uh, tensions between regulations, um, over lawyering to borrow a term if you don't mind and in public health. Um, we, we will be looking uh, forward very much to your paper and your, the series of papers coming out on pandemics and policy. Um, Thank you. Um, now we're going to turn next to uh, Lauren Heller. Uh, Lauren Heller is an associate professor of economics in the Campbell School of Business and a director of the Berry College Honors Program. Her research interests include international health and development economics, as well as a wide variety of policy questions and topics in applied microeconomics. She received her bachelor's degree from Capital University in Columbus, Ohio, and her PhD in economics uh, from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She has published scholarly articles in a wide range of outlets, including the Eastern Economic Journal, Contemporary Economic Policy, Defense and Peace Economics, the Journal of Developing Areas, and Social Science and Medicine. In addition to her research fields, she also enjoys working with students in Barry's honors program and using discussion and multimedia clips to illustrate economic concepts in her classes. I think, Lauren, we will need help with some of these concepts. So we're honored and uh, really uh, genuinely delighted uh, to have you here today. Uh, Lauren, we turn the time over to you. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much uh, for having me. I'm so excited to be here and talking to all the students and policymakers. Um, it's, it's a really neat opportunity to visit Utah in that way. This is one silver lining of the pandemic, right, is we have all these great opportunities uh, to talk to folks that we might not otherwise have. So um, so with that, I'm, I'm kind of a PowerPoint girl, guys. I promise not to bore you to death, um, but I'm going to share my screen. Um, and to give a little talk today um, about government failure in the era of COVID-19 and asking sort of the question, can federalism or at least a more of a reliance on bottom up rather than top down policies um, save us? So that's what I hope to talk about today. So um, here's the basic idea um, is I think we know and many of the students that have had an economics class perhaps um, at um, UVU know that um, markets and liberalism more generally. What you, well, I, I, when I say liberalism, I probably mean classical liberalism or what you guys might refer to as a reliance on individual freedom and markets, that kind of thing, uh, that they've really come under fire um, in the age of COVID-19 um, for a variety of reasons. But um, on the other hand, I think the deficiencies, as Mr. Olson talked about, in unfettered government power um, have also been exposed and have stymied our response. Um, so the question I think we can ask is what lessons can we learn from the various responses to the pandemic that can help us build a healthier, more peaceful world, right? And how can federalism um, in general, and maybe markets in a little more particular, um, help with that? Okay. So first, let's take a step back. To me, before we can talk about government failure, uh, we have to couch that by first talking about market failure. And this is something you guys might um, have heard about in previous economics classes or government classes more generally. Um, this is the idea, I often like to call them market frictions rather than market failures because they're not complete failures of a market to do anything. Uh, but this is the idea that markets might not always perfectly allocate goods and services, um, and particularly in the midst of a pandemic. For example, um, wearing a mask might have positive externalities, positive spillovers um, to other people from protecting ourselves, right? But if we rely on just the private market to decide when we should wear masks or not, it might be the case um, that masks, mask wearing is underprovided relative to what might be socially optimal in a sense, right? Um, we also see um, market failures attributed to public goods that might be underprovided. These are goods um, that are generally both non-rival in consumption and non-excludable. So essentially it's not possible to prevent someone from using these goods regardless of whether they pay for them. Um, so the idea is that markets might not provide these goods as well uh, because if we don't have any incentive to pay for them, we are not gonna pay for them, right? That's the sort of idea. And so typically in economics, we've seen markets come under fire um, and the idea of individual freedom in particular um, come under fire um, in the age of COVID because people are saying, okay, well, we're just not gonna have a sufficient quantity of say a vaccine for COVID. We're not gonna see sufficient mask wearing because people are selfish and horrible and you know, markets don't provide what we need them to provide. However, typically in this discussion of market failure, what we also hear people talk about is well, Right? If markets aren't going to do this thing, why don't we let government do this thing? And what is always interesting to me is people are always quick to talk about, hey, markets don't do these things properly. But then the minute we talk about government, they say, oh, well, the government's going to fix it. No problem. Fixed it. Right Now I don't have to worry about it because some nameless agency is going to come over like Santa Claus uh, and fix all of the problems and we don't have to apply our same tools of economic analysis to government that we just did to markets. So I want to push back on that a little bit today. Um, so I want to talk about two ways to push back on that. What about potential things that we would classify as market failures that might potentially be attributable to government and in this way, I'll be building a lot on what Mr. Olson was talking about recently. Um, and what about government failures more generally um, in response to COVID-19? Um, I think we can see those. And so to do that, 
Um, we're going to start by talking about government attributable market failures, and then we're going to talk about um, public choice analysis, which really gives sort of the theoretical backbone for why we think some of these um, government imperfections might take place. Okay, so one classic um, market failure that we haven't talked about yet um, that is traditionally attributed to markets is a lack of competition. The idea that sellers might be able to gain individually by getting together, um, restricting output and raising price. I mean, and you can date this back to, you know, Adam Smith and before. Adam Smith talked about in the Wealth of Nations, and I'm paraphrasing here, that basically two or three sellers aren't going to get in a room together and talk, except in some contrivance to raise prices, right? Um, and in that case, fewer quantities might be produced than would be socially optimal. From if we had perfect market competition, as many buyers wanted to get in the room and buy the good, as many sellers wanted to get in the room and sell the good as possible. And so typically in economics, right, what I do is we graph that by something like this would be the ideal, right, the competitive supply and demand that we would view on the market. And due to some lack of competition, we'd see a restriction in supply on the market relative to what we might like. Classic examples of this that you might see in an economics textbook would be something like oil production, right? The oil, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries or OPEC, um, they try often to get together and restrict the supply of oil to keep prices high. Uh, the good news is they're very bad at it. Um, and sort of, there's lots of incentives within that dynamic um, to cheat essentially and sell more oil than you say you're gonna sell. Um, but also um, utilities, right? We don't generally have choices, at least in the state of Georgia. I'm not sure how it is in Utah, uh, but we generally don't have a lot of choices when it comes to our electricity producer, our water um, producers. If we don't like the government supplier of water, we're pretty much out of luck. Um, we don't get um, choices in how to allocate that. But an example of a lack of competition um, that you might not have heard about as much um, is the idea of uh, private producers using government regulation, right, in order to stymie competition within on the private market. So um, this is one of my favorite sort of heartstring tuggy um, versions of this. Um, this is an article from uh, a few years ago um, about a hair braider in Missouri who talked about her struggle for hair braiding freedom. Basically, at the time um, in Missouri, um, hair braiders, which are, use all natural products, um, don't use any chemicals or anything. Like they're literally braiding hair, guys, like this, right? Um, and they suffered all kinds of government regulation in order to go um, braid hair because they were forced to get a cosmetology license. A cosmetology license requires thousands of hours um, of class time, thousands of dollars of expenses, all in things that have nothing to do for hair braiding, right? Things like dyeing, cutting, um, you know, sanitization techniques for nails and stuff, something a hair braider would never do, right? But what incentives might be affecting the regulation of the hair braiding market? Do you know who makes up cosmetology boards that decide whether hair braiders need to get licensed? Other licensed cosmetologists. So it's this built-in government incentive to keep out competition from the market. And as a result, our society is poorer, right? Um, and certainly the hair braiders are worse off, but an economist would say society is worse off from that lack of competition. So that's an example of a market failure that's caused by government itself. Um, so how can we see this, right? Market failure, or maybe actually government failure, right? In response to COVID-19. Well, and this is something um, that uh, Mr. Olson talked about um, and that we could talk about forever and ever. Um, but we can see tons of articles about how um, at the beginning of the pandemic in particular, there was tons of red tape in order to get testing, right? I don't know if you guys remember back in March, but basically you had to be a celebrity to get a COVID test. Um, and as a result, um, that definitely made the pandemic worse as a result of getting past all of this regulation in the form of testing. And then um, as testing became more available, finally, right, um, the FDA started authorizing um, quick coronavirus tests that were, didn't take weeks, right, or days to, to 
result in that it could have, say, a 15 minute or a 30 minute test. The article where um, the first article I could find about the FDA authorizing a quick test was from July 6th, right? That is long after um, it was actually needed on the market to potentially stop the spread, right? Quick testing is really important in order to stop the spread of a disease because of the idea um, that you know, lots of people are latent carriers of the virus, right? So if you don't want people to walk around and potentially affect others for two weeks, right, you need to be able to test them quickly so that way they know quickly and can self-isolate or do something to stop the spread. But we had no ability to react because of the um, sort of lack of competition in the testing market, right, um, and in treatments. And so, um, now that talks about market failures potentially attributable to government, but what about government failures um, in response as well, right? So here we're gonna start and talk about sort of a public choice refresher. And I hope with the students, I know we've got high school students here, we've got college students here, we've got legislators here, but I think almost everybody here is above the age of 10. And so I very much hope that we can be real. Like y'all know that Santa Claus isn't real, right? I mean, hopefully my students would gasp at this and say, oh no, you didn't just say that Dr. Heller, you didn't, but I did, okay? And so we like the idea of Santa Claus, right? We've been told since we were little, like it's this jolly, you know, elf and makes us feel good and comes around and gives us presents and Christmas and that's lovely, right? And my argument is we've sort of been taught about American democracy in the same way. Okay, so um, I'm not saying that our ideals of American democracy aren't wonderful, just like the idea of Santa Claus, you know, is wonderful, right? Because you were taught from the time you were in kindergarten or maybe earlier, right? You stood up, you said the Pledge of Allegiance to the American flag, and you were taught that American democracy was right up there with God, apple pie, and something else, right? And that this was our gift to the world right? What could possibly be more wonderful and perfect than American democracy? Well, you guys have all grown up, right? You're all in, you know, college or high school or uh, maybe even some state legislators here. So um, you guys have really grown up, right? And so now I hope we can be real. I hope this is something where I get at least a few of you to shift uncomfortably in your seat a little bit. I think college is, by the way, for that. I always tell my students that if they haven't shifted uncomfortably in their seat by the end of the semester, that they should march all, all the way over to our administration building and demand a refund. Uh, Cause that's not what college is about, right? It's not about confirming our priors, right? It's about thinking critically about the world. So that's what we're gonna do here. Uh, and I understand that that might make some of you uncomfortable and just know that I kind of love that it does, okay? Okay, so um, what are we gonna do? All right, we're gonna apply the same tools of economics that I think many of you might be familiar with to study the political process. So we're gonna turn on and put on our glasses of economics and view politics in a similar way. So we're gonna look at voters as if they were consumers of goods and services, right? We're gonna look at politicians as if they're suppliers of goods and services. And we're gonna think about the incentives that that creates. Okay, so one thing that we believe is that voters are human beings. Okay, I know, shocking, shocking, all right? Um, but basically what we mean by that is like anyone else, they're self-interested. You don't walk into a voting booth and say, you know what? I'm giving up all personal self-interest. I'm only gonna think of the community as I walk into the voting booth, I'm gonna be completely magnanimous. You don't, I know you don't, I don't. OK, and I'll give you an example. I'll try to pick on me or pick on people in our virtual room as much as possible when I talk about these ideas uh, rather than picking on those people over there. Um, so I'll give you an example. So um, for I really when I moved to Rome, Georgia, I really wanted a dog park really badly. I came from an urban setting um, where really a dog park was really useful. I really wanted one. Rome, Georgia, where I live is a pretty rural area. They probably don't have much need for a dog park, right? Uh, but I really wanted one anyway. And up on the ballot um, in a local election, um, they had a special purpose local option sales tax on the ballot. Um, it's called a SPLOSC. There's a, it's, it's basically a really inefficient way to tax things, okay? Um, and they were using this tax to fund a tennis center and a bunch of other 
super expensive things. Um, and at the same time, they tacked it on kind of like pork barrel spending. They tacked on a little dog park on this, right? Um, and I have lots of economic reasons we won't go into to tell you why as an economist, like my soul believes that this tax was inefficient, right? You're using a regressive tax that tends to tax poor people more than rich people to fund things like tennis centers and dog parks, right? Things that wealthier people might want, right? There's all of the deadweight loss and inefficiency of taxation. Like I know in my soul that this loss was probably wrong for my community, right? But you know what I did? Uh, I voted for the dog park anyway, right? Why? Uh, because I wanted the dog park, right? So it wasn't about what was good for the public or even what I knew, right? It was about what, what was gonna provide me with the most services and benefits after accounting for costs to me. And so let's combine this idea, if voters as consumers, with this idea of rational ignorance. And this is really where I may get some people shifting uncomfortably in their seat. Okay, here's the idea. Over 137 million people voted in the last presidential election, right? And there's a um, picture of President Trump on election night with his acceptance speech, right? Uh, over 150 million are predicted for this year, right? So here's my argument. It is very unlikely, guys, that individually one person is going to affect the outcome of the presidential election really small probability, infinitesimally small. It's kind of like buying a lottery ticket with really bad odds, probably worse odds than buying a lottery ticket. And so the idea of rational ignorance is that voters know this, right? They know at some level their vote is unlikely to matter one way or the other, really, right? Um, and so because there are costs to obtaining information about alternative candidates, alternative ideas, right? And the benefits are pretty small, right? Most people are rationally ignorant about political issues. They purposely, at some level, don't research these alternative candidates, issues, ideas, because those things take time. How do I know this? Think about what campaign signs look like, right? Any campaign sign you've ever seen for any election in the history of the planet. Are they like really nuanced positions where you can tell exactly how a candidate stands on issues and you can research the way they, you know, think about things? No, right? Most campaign signs look something like this, right? Something like Heller for president. Not even are they a Democrat or Republican and anything, right? No idea, right? Why are they like this? They're going purposely on name recognition, right? We're flying by on the highway at 50 miles an hour we have, um, they, politicians recognize that we're not doing our research, right, on who Chris Bailey is for judge. We're just not doing it, right? So we're going perfectly on name recognition, which means, right, politicians know this at some level, right? They're interested in winning elections, right? So just like profits might motivate a market entrepreneur, votes are what are going to motivate politicians. So us rationally uninformed voters have to con be convinced to want a candidate, right? Um, and since I had a picture from President Trump's um, election, now I have a, pres a picture from um, former President Obama's election, right? But like, look at these signs, right? Change we can believe in, right? That's great. We got lots of hope and feels, that's great, but we don't have a whole lot of nuance into what those policies are gonna be, right? And so what, what does that result in, right? That results in these things we call special interest issues. These are issues that generate really big benefits for a tiny subsection of society where everybody else is gonna be rationally uninformed about them and it'll impose a small individual cost on them, right? My dog park was one example of a special interest issue, right? It was something that provided a big benefit for me so I went out and voted for it Right? But most other people in Rome, it imposed a very small cost spread out on everyone else in my community. So they didn't have much incentive to lobby against the dog park, right? Another example that I thought might hit home with UVU students, remember I told you guys I always like to pick on people in the room? Yeah, about to do that. Um, let's think about grants 
that you guys might receive from the Utah system of higher education. So I happen to know uh, that Utah Valley is a member of the 10 schools of the Utah system of higher education. And as a result, there is state funding that particularly goes um, to Utah students. All right, and let's think about the criteria that's established um, in order to get these grants. So in order to get these grants, which are pretty big, right? Uh, you've gotta be a resident student in Utah. So you've gotta live in Utah. You've gotta be enrolled at least half time in one of these participating schools, which are only these 10 schools and three private schools. That's it, okay? Um, you've gotta make satisfactory pro progress in school, which can be defined in a variety of different ways. In Georgia, we have this thing called the Hope Scholarship, which is similar. And when students don't make satisfactory pro progress, we call it losing hope, bad joke. Um, but anyway, all right. And you've got to show financial need. So if you think about the entire Utah population, right, the, the number of students that would qualify for this grant are really tiny. Right, a very small sliver in both age, income, um, grades, everything, right, as opposed to the whole Utah population. And so, right, those awards, right, award amounts are pretty big if you think about it, right? So, at one school, um, award amounts range from $400 to $1,000, which might not seem like a huge amount, but that's a lot of money, right, if you think about in terms of concentrated benefits to a group. Right? But the costs of all of those grants are spread out right, over all Georgia taxpayers. So let's think about what incentives that creates. Right? It means politicians have a really strong incentive to favor the views of special interest groups like Utah Valley students, right? even if the action is inefficient. Why is that? Right? Because you guys are getting a concentrated benefit right, from these subsidies. So if they were to take away those subsidies, you have tons of incentive to write your congressman, right? To go march on the state house to say, you know, you may take our lives, but you may never take our school subsidies, right? But all other Utah voters, they're rationally uninformed about it, right? It might be a dollar to their tax bill. They probably don't know about it, right? So politicians have a really strong incentive to favor the views of special interest groups, even if that action is inefficient. I'm not necessarily saying that the subsidies you guys receive um, for school are inefficient. I'm saying that politicians would have an incentive to give you those whether they were efficient or not, okay? And so what are some contemporary challenges from this um, in regard to COVID-19? How about a trade war, right? Um, so if you think about this, trade restrictions are a classic example of a special interest issue, right? Um, so if we're thinking about um, political rhetoric around saving, let's say, t-shirt manufacturers or coal miners or steel workers, right? Or domestic PPE manufacturers, right? Um, those tariffs are benefits that provide concentrated benefits to a really tiny group of people with costs that are spread out over everybody else. We know it's one of the things that every economist everywhere, I've not met many economists um, actually anywhere uh, that think that trade is a bad idea. It's kind of fundamental to everything every economist thinks about everything, right? Um, tariffs are widely known to make society poorer overall, right? In fact, you can look at data, at least correlationally, and the countries over time that are the most close to trade are the ones that grow the slowest. Okay, so tariff restrictions, really bad for economies. But, right, because of this special interest effect, they're more likely to be implemented. As a result, right, um, we saw this particularly come to a head um, from the coronavirus pandemic because lots of these trade restrictions also ended up being on items that all of a sudden we really quickly needed, like personal protective equipment, like masks, right, like respirators in hospitals, like ventilators, right? Um, like all kinds of different things um, that we needed that we were less able to respond, right? Um, as a result of being prepared um, for the crisis. Guys, remember hand sanitizer? Remember when you used to be able to buy that at the store? Wasn't that cute, right? Um, and so, right, as a result, um, we see that we are less able um, to respond amidst a pandemic as a result of these sort of government failures and these political problems. Okay, 
Uh, and the last thing I want to talk about in terms of government failure is political rent seeking. This is the idea that individuals and interest groups right, are going to lobby to try to restructure public policy to get more income from the government to themselves. It's called economic rents based on a whole lot of um, economic history, but essentially economic rents mean profit above and beyond what you'd expect as a normal level of profit in the market. And so anytime someone's lobbying for something, anytime there's a special interest carve out for one particular group, um, that is inefficient for a variety of reasons um, and it makes society poorer. And so one of the reasons that it's inefficient, besides the fact that lots of rent seeking policies do things like restrict competition, increase regulations, as Mr. Olson talked about, that stymie our ability uh, to respond to like a pandemic, um, Another reason that rent seeking is bad for an economy is in the time that we're spending lobbying, right, or asking for a particular thing from government, we're not spending time producing, right, serving others through the marketplace. And so the output of economies with lots of rent seeking always tends to fall below its potential. And you can see this absolutely backed up in data. Um, and so uh, where do we see a ton of rent seeking? I don't know. How about around every bailout, every act that has been involved with the coronavirus pandemic? Um, so the idea um, is that essentially when you're looking at the small business cash that came out of um, the first coronavirus um, sort of stimulus bill, right? So much more of that bill um, went to businesses and special interests than ever went to individual taxpayers. So the real sad part of this um, is that even though individual taxpayers, what did we end up with? Like $1,200 each in certain income levels or something like that? I don't remember what it was. Um, but if you look at what people actually paid in terms of the amount of government spending um, that is going to have to be paid back as a result of the coronavirus, I believe the, the amount per taxpayer totals something over $2,500. So you get a check right, for say $1,200, and then you're on the hook to pay $2,500 thanks to this rent seeking from special interests, right? And this is not limited to the US, right? Um, there's coronavirus corruption cases everywhere you look, right? Um, and, right, the, a lot of people are calling it the corona bailout, right? Um, and this idea um, that special interests are rent seeking and making it more efficient as a result in response to coronavirus. Right, so what's the big lesson we can learn from all of this and how does it connect um, to federalism and ideas of individual freedom? I promise that it does. Um, the basic thing I want to, you guys to get out of this lecture is that um, just as markets might face some barriers to coronavirus response and COVID-19 response, governments also face real obstacles to allocating resources efficiently, right? The idea of American democracy in its pure form, doing all things perfectly is about as real as our idea of Santa Claus, right? Would be nice, um, but doesn't always exist in practice. But understanding this, right? Understanding the strengths and weaknesses of both democracy and markets is important to understand contemporary challenges to liberalism and the federalist system more generally, right? So after I've depressed you all for about 20 minutes, um, is there hope, right? Can federalism save us? Well, I think there is some hope, okay? So if the more bottom up we look, right, the better the news is. So if you look at how individual companies, right, individual groups responded to the coronavirus, um, when people were allowed to come up with individual responses, it's a really positive outlook for humanity, right? So um, private companies and philanthropists, right, swung into action, right? Um, parents are doing amazing things in response to the coronavirus. Lots of people are choosing homeschool over um, and other things during the pandemic because they're saying, you know what? That whole system that I'm getting from my public school, yeah, not working for me. Right, so I'm going to choose a private response for my my kids. I personally did this myself, right? Um, and as a result, um, we're seeing individuals, when left to their own devices, when left to choose for themselves, um, are doing very well, right? And we're seeing um, lots of responses by private companies to this. So what does that mean? 
right? In a larger view of federalism, I think it means that bottom-up approaches to pandemic response will always be better than top-down responses for a variety of reasons. You can take advantage of lots of local knowledge um, that otherwise um, you know, the federal government might not have. Absolutely, about individual state responses, um, individual cultures, um, individuals' ideas of what people in those states think is best for themselves. Um, and so how can federalism help with this, right? So I'm, I'm a pretty pro-federalism girl. Um, I give at least two chairs for federalism um, to re uh, respond to what Dr. Bibby said. Um, I think states are a lot more attuned to local conditions, local needs, local populations. Um, the coronavirus sprung up very differently in different states. The situation in Georgia and Florida is very different than the situation in South Dakota, is very different than the situation in Utah, right? And as a result, um, the more power that the states have um, to allocate resources in response to those local conditions, the more deftly they can maneuver to response to a situation that is continually changing. Is that all we need? Probably not. Um, my sort of classical liberal self probably thinks that doesn't go far enough um, in terms of individual freedoms and responses. Uh, but I think that federalism is a great first step um, to help us in our pandemic response. And with that, um, I'm really looking forward to questions. Wonderful, thank you so, so much. Um, Dr. Heller uh, for your helpful introduction to public choice. Uh, but more generally, some of the ways that uh, different economic perspectives can help us think more deeply about our public response to the pandemic. Uh, I think you made us, some of us shift uncomfortably in our seats in the best way. Um, we have quite a few questions coming in through the chat. And uh, so thank you very much for this stimulating talk. Uh, our next guest is Daniel Mallinson. Uh, Professor Mallinson received his PhD in political science from Pennsylvania State University. His expertise lies in state and local politics and policy, with his main research focusing, uh, uh, excuse me, his main research examining the mechanics of policy diffusion among the U.S. states. Additional interests include public administration and public policy, as well as statistical methodology. He has published in a variety of journals, including Policy Studies Journal, State Politics and Policy Quarterly, State and Local Government Review, and Statistics Policy and Politics. He received the Robert S. Friedman Award for Excellence in Teaching from Penn State University and has published about pedagogy and political science in political science and politics. Uh, just as a side note, uh, uh, Professor Mallinson has written an excellent article uh, titled Cooperation and Conflict in State and Local Innovation During COVID-19, published in the American Review of Public Administration. Um, so we recommend if you have a chance to go take a look at that, that piece. Uh, otherwise, um, thank you for joining us, uh, Daniel, the time is yours. Great, thank you so much. So uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm going to be talking about, I'm of course, the political scientist in the room. So I'm going to be talking about the politics of reopening. Uh, we're talking about a lot about the economics and with really a, an eye towards what, um, what things have I been thinking about in terms of federalism, but also what may we anticipate as we head into the next phase of the pandemic and the pandemic response. Um, all right, so I'm gonna talk about a couple of things. First, I wanna talk a little bit about interstate partnerships. Um, and I appreciate the, the promo of the, the piece that I had in, in ARPA. Um, this will come from that, um, but talk about how states work together uh, to uh, address the pandemic and also to address potential spillovers that occur when of course one state changes its policy and other states don't. Um, so we saw partnerships arise in the spring um, on both shut down and reopen. I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, blowback to the governors against restrictions, really pressure to, on them from all sides. And that will inform, you know, thinking about where governors stand right now. Um, talk a little bit about uh, reopening of the states and uh, what has been happening in terms of cases. And then uh, again, think about some of the takeaways for federalism, but also um, for the, again, the next phase of, 
uh, of the pandemic. So one of the things that I that I wrote about in the in the piece that Andy mentioned, um, uh, but that you know my my research really centers around policy diffusion. So how policy ideas spread among states, and traditionally we see a lot of regional spread. Um, and a, another aspect of my work has also been about uh, the the increase of ideological spread. So you have policies that emerge among uh, liberal states and sort of stay among liberal states, and also again with conservative states. Um, in in the uh, in the COVID pan uh, uh, COVID pandemic and pandemic response among the states in the spring, we did see states join in these partnerships to address both um, shutting down their states as well as some of them uh, having a coordinated reopening. Again, this was recognition, I think, by the states that there are spillovers when one when one state changes a policy um, that can shift, uh, you know, particularly negative behavior that they're concerned about to another state. So um, an example being one of the earliest uh, of these partnerships that we saw was the one in the Northeast. Initially, it was four states, Pennsylvania, New York, uh, Connecticut, and New Jersey. And I'll give a little more background on that in a moment. It's kind of interesting. This expanded to seven states as they looked at reopening. But um, an initial part of that conversation was recognizing that there was a major outbreak right in the New York metropolitan region and simply New York taking action to do things like shutting down bars, shutting down restaurants without coordination with Connecticut and New Jersey um, would simply shift people's behavior, right? People would um, go potentially to bars and restaurants in Connecticut or bars and restaurants in Northern New Jersey. And these were spillovers that the governors um, wanted to prevent. So thus they, they partnered together to, um, to coordinate their policy responses. Um, the next to form was the Western States Pact. Um, and this was formed initially California, Oregon, and Washington, which are three states that work together on a variety of things. Um, but that also expanded over time. Um, and then we saw the, the coordinated reopening uh, in the South uh, to, to reopen those Southern states um, relatively quickly. Uh, compared to some of the other states, and I'll also be talking about that. And then there was the Midwest partnership. So we saw these partnerships arise really in um, recognition of these spillovers, but also, you know, there was um, a lack of a clear federal standard on a lot of the policies that um, that the states were um, were putting into place to mitigate the uh, to mitigate the pandemic. So the states had to work together. Um, and these efforts. The one that I said was kind of interesting and, and a lot of actually um, my research in the area of federalism and state policy is actually on cannabis policy. And one of the fascinating things about these partnerships, I mentioned the West Coast already, they work together on a variety of things, but some of these partnerships we saw during COVID have roots in previous partnerships among states. Um, and so a good example of that was the initial four state partnership um, in the Northeast uh, Governor Cuomo, when this partnership was announced, actually directly cited the 2019 Cannabis and Vaping Summit that the four, the four um, governors had held to try to coordinate on cannabis legalization in the Northeast. Um, and, you know, this is still an ongoing topic right now among these states, but um, it was actually that meeting in that partnership that he pointed to as the genesis of picking up the phone and calling the governors in the other states, or at least their staff picking up the phone and uh, beginning this COVID partnership um, that again expanded into seven states ultimately when, when uh, we came to, to the point of reopening. Um, but this was something that I found really interesting and again wrote about in that piece how um, you know, these previous partnerships have been leveraged in the COVID um, during the COVID pandemic to, to help states coordinate with each other, um, or at least to help certain states coordinate with each other. So we saw partnership in the spring, at least in certain areas. Um, we also saw variation in state responses. There's been several papers written about this. Um, generally, they find that uh, Republican states were slower to, to institute uh, requirements and mitigation efforts than, than Democratic states. They were also more quick to reopen. Although I think what this illustrates is that varies depending on the actual um, uh, mitigation policy. So you can see the orange line, which pretty much all of the states were within about a week of each other, 
Uh, that was the declaration of state emergencies. Um, so the governors all did that fairly quickly. Uh, the next policy was the closure of non-essential businesses. Again, there's not a lot of variation in terms of time across the states. Uh, where you see the most variation are the masking policies. So um, there was a set of masking policies that went into place in typically more democratically controlled or more liberal states in April and early May. And then there was a gap where you saw um, many of the remaining states um, adopt mask mandates um, in June and July. So there is a very distinct difference in the masking policies um, between, between sort of subsets of states. Um, there's also more variation in terms of uh, reopening. So again, um, some of the uh, more conservative uh, Midwestern and Southern states tended to reopen sooner than Northeastern and Western, more liberal states. But if you look at, again, the, the temporal variation, the timing, it's not as, as stark as the mask mandates. Um, so I think it was, it's useful to keep this in mind when we think about you know, red versus blue and what did they do. Um, we do see timing differences between the states, but it's not on every type of mitigation policy. It's only on certain ones. Something that we saw in many states though, um, and I, I talk about uh, pressures from below, pressures from above and pressures from the side in terms of uh, reopening and loosening, loosening the mitigation measures. So one pressure from below that was experienced in a lot of states, the governor's experience were protests. Um, this charts both Black Lives Matter protests and COVID pandemic related protest activity, um, mostly during the summer. And you can see that, of course, after the death of George Floyd, the Black Lives Matter protests um, you know, were widespread throughout the US. Um, but at the same time, COVID protests were occurring. And as we got later in the summer, COVID protest act activity actually um, um, exceeded Black Lives Matter protest activity. Um, this shows where those protests were. The larger the circle, the more the protest activity. Um, and also different types. But essentially what you can see here is a lot of the COVID um, pandemic protests, there were both demonstrations against mitigation efforts and also demonstrations for things like the eviction moratoriums, uh, supporting healthcare workers, um, uh, protest about reopening schools. Um, a lot of these were in more, more urban areas. They also tended to be in state capitals. We saw that a lot of here, a lot here in Harrisburg, right? There was a rally on fall sports um, and a protest on just on fall sports um, and in August when those decisions were being made. Um, so it was uh, across the country, though to put this in context, it's not just within the United States. So these are global demonstrations as well as political violence over um, COVID, the, related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and so of course, there's a lot of protest activity in Europe where there were pretty start, strict um, uh, shutdown and, and quarantines put into place. Um, South America, India, a lot of actual political violence um, in India. Um, and so this was a global phenomenon as well. It just was not, it wasn't just here in the States. So there was this pressure from below uh, against governors uh, and, and some of the mitigation policies. Of course, there was pressure from above, particularly from the president. Um, this was a series of tweets that I wanna say was in May or June, um, where the, the president listed, that had a series of tweets saying to liberate particular states and that was liberate them from their um, COVID requirements. Um, and so uh, there was pressure certainly from, a, from the president from above to for states to reopen. Uh, there were also the stances taken by Center for Medicare Medicaid Services. Uh, they put into place a reopening plan pretty quickly. Um, so there was this pressure on governors from above. And then of course, from the side. So this is right here in Pennsylvania. Uh, we have Governor Wolf and Health Secretary Levine. Um, and then uh, we have uh, Mr. Cutler, who's the sec who's, who was the Senate, uh, House Majority Leader and is now the Speaker of the House. Um, our, our legislature is controlled by the uh, Republican Party, and they have consistently pushed back against the governor, tried to override um, his mitigation um, effort, you know, his mitigation policies um, ever since the summer. Uh, there have been a series of lawsuits that have been both state and federal court over 
um, the governor's actions. Uh, and so it's been it's been pretty contentious here. So the legislature has been pushing against the governor as well. So governors have been facing, you know, we talk about them being at the forefront of this response in many ways, um, but they've also faced a lot of pressure from sort of all directions as we think of you know, the hierarchy or the structure of our federal system um, at the same time. Something else we have seen is as states have removed, and this is again, not just restricted to the United States, Europe has seen this as well, but as states removed restrictions, there was return of uh, the spread of COVID. Um, this was a recent, recently published um, chart on Indiana. Um, you can see the marker where Indiana lifted their, all of their restrictions. Um, and there's been uh, fairly uh, sharp increases in COVID in that state. Although, you know, this isn't, this isn't exactly the causal story in every single state. Um, states, as was mentioned, varied a great deal in terms of when they have dealt with uh, COVID, uh, COVID um, infections and the community spread of COVID. Um, and that's actually the sort of last where things stand piece that I wanted to talk about. These, this is a CDC case tracker data. Um, this is normalized by population. So this is case counts per 100,000 population. And something you can see is, uh, so the green, the green or the purple is California, um, which, is, which is down here. Um, the, I'm sorry, the purple is California. The green is Florida. You see the Florida had a much higher peak, but Florida has also seen its cases drop um, since that peak uh, early on in the, in the pandemic. California is finally seeing a drop off. Um, but where we're starting to see cases pick up are the Midwestern and Western more rural states like South Dakota and Indiana. Um, these are also states where it was, you know, th there were not as many restrictions um, on, uh, or not as many sort of stringent mitigation efforts. Um, and so, you know, there's questions about what governors will be able to do in the face of the, the, the increases that have been seen more recently. Um, I didn't add it in here, but of course, you know, countrywide, we're in the midst of our third peak. Um, we had a peak in the spring and that came down and plateaued and then a peak in the summer. And now we're really entering the third peak. Um, and why I feel like that's important, both the point about Midwestern states and the U.S. is uh, goes into my sort of final thoughts to wrap this up. Um, so a couple of them deal with federalism and a couple of them deal with kind of where we're at and what governors face. So um, in terms of what I've been thinking about of implications for federalism, um, one of the things that Don Kettle has been talking a lot about, he just had a book that came out about this, um, but the lack of federal coordination on uh, COVID-19 and sort of states going in a variety of directions exacerbates inequalities, right, the, um, in across states. Um, and that's something that has, uh, there's been a lot of talk about that, um, but it's certainly something that, um, you know, I think that we need to, to talk more about and, and determine how to address. Um, again, Don makes, sort of puts his thoughts forward about that. Others have different thoughts about um, these inequalities that exist across the U.S. Uh, that result from, uh, you know, the, uh, the result from our federal system. Um, the other point is that it's going to be tough for governors to restrict again. We're seeing that here in Pennsylvania. We're seeing a pretty sharp increase in COVID cases, um, but the politics that I've talked about, uh, really the dynamics from all sides for the governors are going to make it very hard for governors to uh, do the types of things they did in the spring, especially if we have a, a stronger uh, peak in the winter, like many are predicting. Um, so we're going to see what governors may have less latitude this time around um, because of the, the evolving politics of this. Uh, there's also been an erosion of state trust in the federal government. I think this is evident with how states are approaching a vaccine. I mean, states like California, New York are saying that they won't distribute or promote a vaccine until they themselves separately review the, the clinical trial data. And that is, that is, to my knowledge, not, I don't know that that's ever happened or that's ever been an issue. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but that's unusual. Um, and that'll, you know, may serve to undermine trust in, in vaccination that comes out. Um, you know, there's questions about whether this is idiosyncratic to, you know, the president or this current crisis or whether there's, this is a broader breakdown in our federal system. And that can be a point of discussion. 
And then finally, related to some of my, again, my other work, um, we saw, I think, a lot of partisan learning and, and ideological learning in terms of uh, what states led and followed each other in, during the pandemic. And so I'm interested in, you know, one of the things that I am interested in is whether we're going to see more partisan and ideological learning and less of the sort of traditional learning pathways that we've seen in the past. Um, but with that, I wanna wrap it up so we have a few minutes, at least for questions. Um, so thank you. All right, thank you so much, Professor Mallinson. We really appreciate that uh, presentation. Um, thank you for helping us not to forget about the importance of interstate partnerships. Uh, we would love to follow up with you on your research on, on trust as well as uh, partisan learning. So thank you for your, your talk. Um, I'd like to actually direct a question to Professor Heller. I know that you have a hard stop in about five and a half minutes or so. Um, and so if you're okay, we'd like to ask you at least one question. We have a student question and I'll just tack on a little uh, a question from, from us to that and just let you respond as you, as you like. Um, so Britt asks, um, how could we think about government reforms that would allow for better or more uh, competition? And so the add on to that question would be, um, what resources uh, could you recommend for students interested in learning more, uh, either about public choice or classical liberal economics? Okay, wonderful. And I um, thank you for the question. Also, thank you guys for being so um, considerate of my hard stop. I actually do. I'm teaching a class next door at 1230. So that's, that's the reason for my hard stop. But um, anyway, so um, I think um, that there's lots of ways that we can encourage competition. Um, it seems to me um, that one big way to do that is to actually decrease the role of government um, in economic markets. So a common misconception, a lot of people think that one reason if, if markets have a lack of competition, that potentially we need government to step in to sort of increase competition in the marketplace. Um, but if you look at that empirically, a lot of what we find is that the more intervention of government in private markets, actually the bigger barriers to competition, even in so let's say antitrust regulations or things that have the well-intentioned idea of increasing competition. Um, and so um, I think at best, I think when we're thinking about things like antitrust policy or even just well-intended regulation in one way or another, that we might actually worry about the potential drawbacks of a decrease in competition. So to sort of dovetail off of uh, what Mr. Olson talked about when he talked about all of the potential regulations that employers are facing, for example, right now in the face of COVID-19. You can think of that, all of those regulations probably had, if I'm gonna be you know, uh, good, I think all of those regulations probably had a well-intentioned um, reason for them, right? In terms of employment law and protecting employees and things like that. But the unintended consequence was that there was an inability to react. And it also um, hinders small businesses far more than it hinder, hinders large businesses, right? Because um, in many ways, large businesses have those teams of lawyers and other things um, that can respond and accountants and things can respond to regulations that small businesses just can't have. Um, so I think um, I have a whole lot of faith in individuals, I really do, um, and I think it's sort of the good news from all of this, but the more we can rely um, on individuals in that way, I think the better off we are. Um, now, for those of you that are interested in public choice economics, um, I think there's lots of really cool resources out there. Um, if you're interested, um, certainly, um, there's lots of work um, from a Nobel laureate. His name was James Buchanan, not to be confused with President James Buchanan. You gotta like Google James Buchanan economist. Um, and you'll find lots of information uh, about his contributions um, to public choice economics. Um, there's also, if we're thinking about um, in terms of government intervention, 
um, and COVID-19, I think I'm going to give a shout out to an old book um, called Crisis in Leviathan that talked about um, essentially the middle of a crisis. We see all of this ramping up of regulations and sort of government control. And then it sort of doesn't ramp back down when the pandemic's over. I think that might be especially good reading um, in a time like this. Um, but yeah, and I, um, for sure, students, um, if you'd ever like to email me and think of some other um, resources for public choice economics, I'd be happy to email you back. I love interacting with students. Uh, my email is lheller at barry.edu. Thank you again. Have a great class. We very much appreciate your talk today, and we hope to follow up with you soon. Thank you, Professor Heller. Bye-bye. <laughs> Great, so we have a couple of questions uh, uh, incoming actually. So um, I'd like to ask this question for both of our panelists. Uh, this is uh, from a student. Um, the question is, examples of bottom-up advantages to disaster response abound, but with COVID-19 in mind, in what situations might a top-down response be most advantageous? And I'll let either of you uh, field that question as you like. Would Professor Mellinson like to go ahead or? Uh, in, otherwise I will. In the, uh, in the literature about this, it's sometimes said that, uh, for example, a unified research attempt uh, would be uh, more efficiently handled by a central government than by uh, collaboratives or consortia of state governments. Um, an interesting feature of this year has been the extent to which uh, the Centers for Disease Control, which to some extent were intended to uh, serve some of that, have been missing in action. and. Uh, I wrote a piece this spring about the constitutional division of powers in which most pandemic response has always been reserved to the states. And that was certainly true during the so-called Spanish flu episode a century ago, even though you had a President Woodrow Wilson who wanted to federalize countless other things. Nonetheless, the states took the lead in responding. But as federal involvement in pandemics was layered on, uh, it was carefully done from a con constitutional standpoint. Uh, they added things related to the admission of people and uh, goods to the country, thus taking advantage of, of the, that federal constitutional power. And they added things like the CDC, which were intended as helpers, as um, things that would make the states more effective uh, in taking that lead. Uh, we have, uh, someone said that they did a uh, uh, disaster simulation and no one predicted that the CDC would be as inactive in the case of a pandemic as it has turned out to be. So I just take it around to a point that I've been kind of uh, dying to make about federalism, which is that in uh, theoretically deciding between a federalist and a highly centralized system, uh, it can be a temptation to assume that the centralized system would be run by people just like us, whereas the states are inevitably going to be run by a range of people, some of whom we disagree with. We put ourselves in the shoes of the one federal decision maker. This year has reminded a lot of us that we might not get to be at that central decision maker. The central decision maker might have priorities and uh, weigh values differently than we do, and it's a humbling thing. And it suggests, again, the good side of federalism, which is that at least some of the major states are likely to be following the policies that we like. And building on that, I mean, I think I'm, I appreciate the point about si the science, right, and research endeavor and the, the issues with the CDC and the FDA during this. I mean, I think of an important role for the federal government that we haven't seen um, you know, successfully done in this pandemic is having clear and consistent messaging on the science, on what we know, and also the uncertainty um, of the science. Uh, there's been, you know, very inconsistent messaging from the White House versus public health officials, um, and and that has not, you know, that that has not helped um, certainly, and it puts us in this position again. I mentioned of distrust um, between, uh, you know, states and the federal government, the CDC. Um, I'm working with a colleague right now on studying the CDC, and it's. Uh, you know, I think there's, there's probably going to be a lot written about 
the political dynamics of this pandemic and the White House and CDC um, and how, you know, that uh, that institution wasn't able to provide what it was intended to, um, um, as is being mentioned here, right, and in, in, in its purpose for creation. So, um, yeah, I would agree with that, like consistent messaging and, um, uh, and information. Maybe I could throw in one more point, uh, if there's time, which is that the U.S. is not, of course, the only federalist country. And uh, it's been interesting in the course of the pandemic that um, the various other federalist systems have been, uh, well, they've been arranged. I mean, we can start with Brazil, which has not generally been considered successful at all, uh, which is a federalist system. But then you turn to Germany and Canada, often cited as some of the most uh, well-run uh, Switzerland is another, but Germany and Canada have both distinguished themselves uh, for getting exceptionally good results during the course of the pandemic. Uh, I know a bit more about the German response in which the German states have quite a bit of medical responsibility. For example, I was startled to find that they were the ones who decided on whether or not tests could be used and apparently worked smoothly there. They had early access to the various tests because uh, their regulatory process was a good one. Clearly on the messaging that Professor Mellinson uh, mentioned, probably we'll find in both Canada and Germany that uh, the federal governments were important in messaging and uh, Angela Merkel, chancellor in Germany, has sometimes been described as having saved her popularity by the effectiveness with which we, she provided. Even if she didn't have all the power in her hands, she did have most of the messaging in her hands and apparently uh, turned that to the advantage of her country. Thank you. I, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Uh, one question that we have have seen uh, in general as a, as a theme that has run throughout the conference is the, the virtues and potential limitations of federalism. Now, one of the often touted virtues or strengths of the federal system, a federal system, is in the words of Justice Brandeis, that it allows for the experimentation, you know, the, the laboratories of democracy argument. Uh, and so I guess the question here is, to what extent uh, do you think that this idea that, that the states can experiment on their own um, is relevant in a public health crisis? And I'll, I'll let um, either or both of you uh, take that question. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I don't think it's irrelevant, but I think one of the challenges with that framework or that, you know, thought framework is that that's typically a process that takes time, right? It's about lesson learning and states trying things and some things failing, some things succeeding, and then other states taking them and adapting them to their local environments and et cetera. Um, and that typically takes time. Whereas a pandemic is something where, you um, it requires a lot of speed and flexibility. Um, and so on one hand, um, I could imagine that you can gain some benefit from that decentralization and the response by seeing sort of what is working in some places and what's not working in others. But then you, I think you still need a national actor that can marshal those lessons quickly. And, and again, I mean, just going back to consistent messaging and, and um, information, you know, can share that with others as opposed to it sort of having to be a bit of a free for all among the states. Um, and again, we, I, you know, yeah. So um, I, I, I think it, I, I think it can apply, but um, you know, I think we'd we'd have to be willing then for the response to um, to be slower, um, and you know, and, and that has implications that you know, for people, for public health, um, and for the pandemic. Um, but again, you know, if one single actor steps in and gets it wrong, then that impacts everyone versus um, some, if you have 50 actors and some of them do well and some of them don't, I mean, it's not great for the states that don't. And again, I go back to some of Don Kettle's writing on this, um, but it doesn't impact everybody, which was, you know, part of that Brandeis's thought framework, so. Um, and my initial thoughts, good. I, I would add, I wrote a piece this spring um, identifying and, and praising some of the ways in which states were uh, setting examples 
getting out in front of issues of finding extra hospital uh, capacity, for example, and uh, getting tests out in more unusual ways. Some of those went well, some of them were flops. Uh, again, we, um, in retrospect, will we'll know more, but uh, here in Maryland and also in a number of other states, governors kind of took the lead in messaging, uh, stepping into the vacuum, frankly, on federal messaging. Eventually we had uh, Anthony Fauci and, and Deborah Birx, but for long periods, there was a real vacuum of effective federal messaging, which of the sort that you would have expected to come from the CDC institutionally. And I think, it, um, uh, some of the reasons why the states uh, got pushed out somewhat awkwardly. And, and in Maryland, I'll, I'll also mention that um, our governor Hogan at the time chaired the National Governors Association and talked about how they would have conference calls uh, through the National Governors Association to spread best practices and good ideas. And yet in some ways that was second best because before uh, the last couple of years, everyone would have assumed that the CDC would be presiding over exactly that kind of information sharing, would be taking the lead on best practices and so forth. Um, the very imperfect state response to some extent was an effort to fill a vacuum in an area where all people charged with these jobs in government tended to assume that there would be strong CDC leadership. And in its absence, people made shift with what they could. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um I think we're just about time, but I, I wanna thank you both um, for a thought provoking discussion uh, for our second day here and for helping us to think about the, the economic and regulatory dimensions of reopening. Uh, we look forward to following up with both of you. Uh, just a quick question for both of you. Um, what are you working on next? Uh, where can we find your research? Uh, uh, just tell us a little bit about what you're gonna be working on for the next uh, little while. I'm going to be turning probably um, to issues of election law. I've worked a lot on redistricting and uh, the natural cycle is uh, going to make that a big issue because the census information that has been gathered this year will be sent to the states and will require redistricting in, in all the states. Uh, it's full of federalism issues and uh, it's also full of chance to play with maps, which has always been fun for me since I was a kid. and. Uh, so I, I doubt it will raise exactly the same issues, and yet it will force us to confront, again, um, election law, I would argue, has been successful in many ways because uh, it is so driven by localities, and the federal government cannot prescribe all that much of how even a national presidential election works. Those states are right there making decisions that I think overall leave us better off than if the federal government were making all of them. And um, so I work, um, I do, a, main, a big part of my work is uh, shared with Lee Hanna at Wright State, and we work on cannabis policy. And of course, it's a, it's a fascinating federalism puzzle for us because of the state liberalization underneath the framework of federal prohibition. And so um, we have a book project that we're working on about the, the emergence and spread, particularly of medical marijuana, um, medical cannabis policies uh, in the states. So we've read many books that, that take really a federal perspective on drug policy and cannabis policy, but we really want to, uh, you can't really understand the story of cannabis policy in the U.S. without understanding the states. Um, Fascinating. Thank you so much to both of you. I look forward to continuing the conversation with both of you. And um, at this point, uh, I just want to thank the uh, Utah Federalism Commission once more for their support for this event. Our next uh, panel is on state and local leadership during COVID-19. So we'll continue the conversation there and we look forward to seeing you.